Great. Good morning. Thank you all for joining us this morning for the release of the eighth uh, report from the state health plan uh, regarding the health care costs to the state health plan and uh, by extension, the people of North Carolina. This particular report is called Overcharged State Employees, Cancer Drugs and the 340B Drug Pricing Program. This is again the eighth one of these uh, reports that we've put out. And uh, before I get this press conference started and let you all talk to the researchers, I wanted to, to provide a reason. Why are we doing this? Why is the state plan, state health plan, spending time, resources, personnel, hours to explore why healthcare is so expensive in North Carolina? And we all know that it is horribly expensive. In fact, Forbes recently, uh, last fall, ranked North Carolina number one in the country for health care costs, number three worst state in the country for overall health care results, including the cost of care, availability of care and outcomes. Um, that obviously extends to the state health plan. We've had quite a few conversations over the years, most recently around GLP-1 drugs. Uh, the fact that the health state health plan is on a fiscally insolvent pathway. We cannot afford to spend this kind of money anymore in order to maintain this benefit for those that teach, protect, and serve. Um, as I always like to say before we talk about that, this, this is not about the hardworking people, the people that save lives every day. This is about the administration. These are about the people who have forgotten, they have started to put or have been putting profits over patients. The treasurer uses that that phrase all the time. This is not about the hardworking people that are out there saving lives every day. Um, I mentioned earlier, we've been in the news quite a bit talking about GLP-1 drugs and the uns unsustainable costs of the state health plan that adds on top of all these other costs that essentially has us looking at insolvency within the next couple of years. But I would like to say that uh, as much as we've um, battled externally with the uh, pharmaceutical industry, they too think the 340B plan uh, needs much, much work and there needs to be a lot more accountability on how 340B hospitals operate. Um, today we have uh, Julie Havlak. Of course, we have State Treasurer Falwell here who is the, uh, the leader of this whole uh, project. Julie Havlak, who is with the State Health Plan Saeed Nikpe, who is an associate professor at the University of Minnesota Division of Health Policy and Management. Christopher Whaley, who's an economist and associate professor in the Department of Health Services, Policy and Practice at Brown University School of Public Health. They are all here to um, give you a presentation. Uh, we will have a Q&A uh, in the last 10 minutes or so of the um, 10 to 15 minutes of the press conference. Um, I think there's a note on, on the GoTo webinar that says, please raise your hand should you have a question. Uh, Julie Havlak will MC, uh, the, the, um, we'll go through the whole study with you all, but we wanted to give um, Treasurer Falwell an opportunity to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Uh, I'm State Treasurer Dale Falwell. Thank you all for joining us both virtually and, and online. As I've said many times over the last few years, uh, when it comes to health care costs and rising prescription drug costs, uh, this is like an onion. Uh, the more we peel, the more we cry. Unfortunately, the people who are crying are those that teach, protect, and otherwise serve, uh, and taxpayers like them. <clears throat> I was with uh, many other state treasurers last week where we had a uh, hours-long discussion about what a fiduciary is. <clears throat> Fiduciaries, the word fiduciary goes all the way back to Roman times. It means never putting yourself in front of the people that you're here to serve. <clears throat> this is just the latest report of us trying to put sunshine on the serious situation that's facing us at the state health plan. Just as we have a fiduciary here at the treasurer's office responsibility, so do the funders of the state health plan, which is North Carolina General Assembly. They have the same fiduciary responsibility that we do to make sure that our plan is properly funded. Uh, I'll turn it over to the researchers in a moment, but just to, to refresh your memory. Uh, when we first started on this issue many years ago, it, we talked about the sources of waste 
in healthcare. Uh, the fact is, is that uh, the North Carolina hospitals and the pharmaceutical industry in this state, in almost a snap of a finger, could resolve the solvency issues of the health plan. Number one, on health care, they could start abiding by President Trump and President Biden's executive orders and showing people what things cost. <clears throat> Number two, uh, the hospital executives could decide to stop breaking people's kneecaps for not paying their bill and protect them as consumers. Uh, number three, they could start matching the charity care uh, with the billions of dollars of local and state tax benefit that they receive. Just in this report, in the executive summary, uh, you'll see many, many examples of just on this one program where the profit that they make off the 340B program exceeds, exceeds the charity care they offer. Not to mention all the other things that go on in these facilities. One example in the executive summary is at High Point Hospital, which is run by Atrium, uh, one cancer drug that has an average cost at that facility uh, to them of $517. Uh, they charge the state health plan $5,350, a tenfold increase in terms of the cost of these drugs. So with that, as I've done with all these other reports, I'd like to turn it over to Julie, and I want to tell her and uh, every, all the other researchers that are involved in this project, uh, thank you for letting us stand on your shoulders. One of our jobs here is to always to advocate for the invisible. Uh, you'll never know the impact that you will have on those that teach, protect, and serve, and taxpayers like them when you put sunshine on issues like this of where we're getting gouged. And this is the reason, this is one of the many reasons that the state health plan is going insolvent. We are proud of the fact that the state health plan years ago made decision to properly pay primary care physicians, properly pay mental health specialists, properly pay physical therapists, because we think those are the people closest to the health and well-being of, of our state. We're proud of the staff at the state health plan who have cut not millions or tens of millions, but hundreds of millions of dollars in expenses out of the state health plan. We have done all we can to make sure that our plan stays solvent and to make sure that we're not raising premiums on those that teach, protect, and serve. But when you see reports like this, you will understand just when the General Assembly only funds us at a 4% rate and does not reimburse us for COVID-related expenses, you can see why it's becoming more and more difficult to do that when healthcare and prescription drug costs, uh, prescription drug costs are going up nearly double digits. So with that, I'll turn it over to Julie. Thank you, Treasurer. I'm Julie Havlack. Healthcare in North Carolina is not affordable. State employees have to work one week out of every month just to afford the family premium on the state health plan. One in five families are in collections for medical debt in North Carolina, and hospitals have sued almost 8,000 patients to collect medical bills in our state. The state health plan faces a $32 billion unfunded healthcare liability. To protect the future of the state health plan, Treasurer Falwell invited researchers in the state health plan to investigate the price of cancer drugs billed to state employees under the 340B drug pricing program. Esoteric though it might sound, the 340B program is the second largest federal prescription drug program in the nation. It was originally created to help safety net healthcare providers serve low income and rural communities. It allows hospitals to purchase most outpatient drugs with an average conservative discount of 34.7% from pharmaceutical manufacturers. However, 340B hospitals have no legal obligation to share those discounts with vulnerable patients or disadvantaged communities. Instead, our research found that 340B hospitals build state employees an average markup of over five times their dis discounted acquisition costs for oncology drugs. Those price markups on cancer drugs can be lucrative. For example, one treatment with Pramuzabab a cancer drug used to treat melanoma, 340B hospitals acquired the drug for roughly $8,000, but billed the state health plan almost $22,000, yielding an average price markup 
So their average profit of nearly $14,000 per claim. State employees and taxpayers are all paying for that price markup with premiums, taxpayer dollars, and lost wages. On average, 340B hospitals, compared to non hospitals outside of the program, collected an 85% higher price markup. For Atrium Health, which sued thousands of patients and put liens on the homes of cancer survivors, those 340B discounts alone were worth nearly $693 million from 2018 to 2020. That does not even include the price markups charged to patients. Many 340B hospitals and other healthcare providers fulfill their charitable mission and provide life-saving care to those who could not otherwise afford it. We are honored their work. However, federal data shows that on average, North Carolina 340B hospitals have increasingly expanded into wealthier neighborhoods with a higher percentage of, uh, in, of insured patients who can pay more for drugs. Furthermore, the vast majority of those 340B hospitals did not provide enough charity care to equal the estimated value of their tax exemptions. For patients, especially cancer patients, the bills for prescription drugs can be crushing. On one cancer survivor who was sued by Atrium Health for $74,000 told me that, quote, I worry I won't be able to make my payments and keep my home. I'm middle class. I don't have a million dollars to pay medical bills. Treasurer Falwell is count calling for greater transparency and accountability for hospitals' charitable mission. I'm now going to turn it over to Christopher Whaley, who helped analyze the state health plan medical claims data, and then Saeed Nikkei, who helped us analyze the socioeconomic of 340, data of 340B hospitals. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Julie. And uh, just to expand on, on what uh, Treasurer Falwell mentioned, the state of North Carolina health plan has a fiduciary obligation both to the individuals who work for the state and their, their families who receive health insurance as a benefit, as well as taxpayers. And, uh, many purchasers do not take those fiduciary obligations uh, to their full extent and do not uh, uh, engage in ensuring that plan dollars are used efficiently. And so I commend the state of North Carolina, uh, both the health plan and the treasurer's office, for actually investigating what's going on in its plan and using claims data to understand prices paid by, by the state, in many cases negotiated on behalf of the state, and then having the difficult conversations of assessing uh, whether or not those prices align with the value that the state health plan is getting. That's a, a challenging conversation that many uh, states aren't willing to, to engage in. And so again, I, I commend the state of North Carolina for having uh, those conversations and actually going deep into their own data. Secondly, what this report really reveals is just the uh, tremendous price margins that hospitals that are eligible for the 340B program are able to charge. In addition to having much higher prices, what this report, is along, along with uh, several other studies, reveals is that savings from the 340B program are not passed back to, uh, to patients, and in many cases, uh, patients with cancer end up paying exorbitant bills that hospitals are able to acquire uh, treatments for uh, at a much lower discount. And so the original intent of the 340B program was to ensure that hospitals are able to provide uh, medical care and, and provide drugs to vulnerable patient populations. But what this report, report reveals is that clearly the 340B program has gone astray from its original intent. And so uh, I want to turn it over to, to Dr. Nikpe, but again, I, I commend the state for actually conducting this type of analysis, as well as the several other reports on this topic that the state has conducted. Thank you, Dr. Whaley. And I would like to echo Dr. Whaley by saying this is excellent work that has been done. Uh, I really commend the state for wading into this issue. It is uh, not a very transparent program. Transparency is desperately needed in the 340 space understand how patients are benefiting from the billions of dollars of 340B profits that are being generated through the uh, sale of drugs to patients. So uh, what I would like to say is, uh, you know, also echoing Dr. Whaley, we see from this report and also from published literature uh, nationally using hospitals, not just from North Carolina, that this program is quite a windfall for hospitals. And it also you know, has very little requirements uh, that hospitals actually 
put that put those resources back into helping the patients that it was originally designed to help. Um, so in uh, the case of contract pharmacy, which is also looked at in this paper, we see basically that hospitals are very sophisticated at identifying ways to increase profits beyond just the four walls of the hospital. Um, so for lots of cancer drugs, drugs are administered within the hospital and the hospital makes 340B profits. The contract pharmacy piece of this analysis really, uh, really demonstrates that 340B hospitals have a great reach into communities that sometimes are quite far away from the hospital. Um, and the basic premise of 340B is in plain language, buy low, sell high. And so anytime a North uh, citizen of North Carolina goes to their local CVS, if they've got a contract with a 340B pharmacy, uh, they are contributing to 340B profits, whether they knew it or not. Um, and so again, I commend the state. I think this is part of a really much needed um, uh, push for transparency in this program. And I am looking forward to seeing how people in the stakeholders in North Carolina relax, re react to this uh, really wonderful report. Julie. Yes, Julie. Yes, Julie. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we're gonna open it up to questions. Chris, if you want to ask about the medical claims data that we analyzed, uh, Christopher Whaley is your, uh, the person you're going to want to direct your questions to. Uh, please use the chat. Um, you, you can hit the raise hand button on GoToWebinar, or you can type your question in the chat and we'll share it with the panelists. Uh, Christopher has a hard stop at 11, so I would advise directing your questions to him first. And thank you so much. Julia, it's Treasurer Falwell. My first question is, could someone put a little more color on the part of the report uh, that talks about uh, these pharmacies being more located in hyper uh, affluent wealth areas, please? Thank you. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I would I would be happy to answer that. So the way that you make profits from this program is from you know, dispensing drugs to patients, not patients who are safety net reliant, who can't pay, who maybe don't have insurance. That's not how you make money from that pro from the program. The way you make money from the program is by finding people who are wealthier, who are insured, who can pay that full copay, and also who have an insurer behind them uh, that's gonna that's gonna deliver and is gonna have a high reimbursement rate for that drug. And so that is the way that you maximize 340B profits. Um, and what your report, what this report shows, what the data from North Carolina show, which is very similar to the rest of the, the country, is that hospitals tend to be relatively sophisticated at placing those, uh, those contract pharmacy agreements in communities where they're going to make the most money from, uh, from dispensing 340B. Thank you so much. And uh, I want to uh, also acknowledge Artis Watkins, who is the executive director of the State Employees Association of North Carolina, uh, who has been partnered, partnering with us and with me for the last uh, eight years uh, to try to get more sunshine uh, on all these issues related to healthcare costs and is related to uh, pharmaceutical costs. So Artis, thank you and your executive team and your organization for standing behind us. Uh, with that, uh, I'm sure we have some questions in person and then we'll go to the questions online. Can you talk about specifically triangle hospitals? I assume all three of our triangle hospitals, major hospital systems are part of this program. And also, are we seeing similar markups across the board with all hospital systems or are certain more egregious than others? Julie, could you address that or one of the other uh, uh, researchers? Hmm. Or either, either one of you, three of you. Sure. Um let me quickly just direct you to where to find that information on the report, and then I'm going to toss it over to Chris Whaley. So if you look, uh, Christopher could answer if, if he thinks this is a national problem also. Great. If you look at page 15 on the report, you're going to see hospital systems average markup on oncology drugs. That includes Duke, UNC, Atrium, Novant, all of the other major hospital systems. The average price markups, there's a huge range. Some people are getting close to nine times 
while others are hovering at less than two times. So that is where I would direct you. And then also page 16 breaks down their average price markups, including the 340B acquisition cost of individual hospitals. Uh, and I'm gonna kick it over to Chris, um, if, you, if, you, if there's anything you'd like to add. Uh, so to, to answer the, the second portion of your question, the uh, unfortunate answer is that uh, that the state of North Carolina actually resembles the rest of the country. And in a national study that we published earlier this year, uh, looking at a very similar question, we, we actually found that the markups nationally are actually quite similar to, to in the state of North Carolina. Uh, and so the, the 340B or hospitals eligible for the 340B program get the benefit of both uh, being able to acquire drugs for a, a much lower price, as well as being, large, in many cases, large academic systems that are able to command high negotiated prices when they negotiate prices with insurers uh, and essentially get margins on, on both ends of the equation. And can you talk a little I'll bit? Follow up. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Just no, a, you're all good. If you talked, did you talk with cancer patients and talk a little bit about how they talked about this affecting them? Obviously, this increases cost of the state health plan. I assume those costs are in some way passed along to patients. Uh, any interviews with uh, actual cancer patients uh, would be helpful from uh, any of the researchers. Uh, and how this manifests itself is in terms of eventually it results in us not being able to lower premiums, having more difficulty freezing premiums, and may even be have to increase premiums. Uh, and that matters differently to uh, different employees in state government, uh, many are, who are struggling, as you heard Julie say, the family premium on the state health plan this year is such that people have to work one week out of four to pay the family premium. So it's not just that, but it's also our willing, our uh, ability up to this point to hold the line on deductibles and co-pays. Because too often in these large health plans, they'll tell you your premium is frozen but they go into the in, insides of the plan and start messing around with deductibles and co-pays, which is not something we've done. Uh, people sometimes laugh at my uh, hit reputation for couponing, uh, but several years ago when I stopped by Brugger's Bagels to get my free bagels, uh, which is at the bottom of the receipt, uh, there's a, a bunch of uh, college professors, retired college professors sitting there. And one of them had told me the story and of uh, the, unfortunately he uh, their beloved uh, dog uh, was going through cancer treatment and uh, so was his spouse and uh, this is a very sophisticated person and he was telling me the story that he thinks that uh, this drug that was possibly given to his dog except in a larger dosage was given to his wife uh, but the cost was 20 times higher <laughs> so I'm sorry, I don't have more to put on that, but the fact is, is that it doesn't matter what political party you're a member of, what race you are, what gender you are, or how you feel about any particular topic in our society right now, everyone knows that something is wrong with higher drug cost. Julie, do you have anybody or uh, Christopher about interviewing any cancer patients? Hi there. Yes, uh, in our past, in the state health plans past work with uh, Duke Law researchers, we found out that, again, hospitals have sued almost 8,000 people. The treasurer's office independently conducted surveys of some of those patients. And we talked to cancer survivors who, when they were so sick, they were unemployable, could barely think, let alone read bills. They were getting charged tens of thousands of dollars in interest from those bills uh, because the state had, the hospital Atrium Health had taken them to court and had put liens on their homes. And one of the things that, one of the reasons we're calling for greater transparency in the 340B pro program is one of Atrium's hospitals, as the treasurer mentioned earlier, Atrium uh, High Point Medical Center, with the, for the state health plan, it had billed roughly $5,000 on a drug that it acquired for roughly $500. $100. That's a 10 times price markup. And if patients are paying the full freight and being sued for the full freight of those drugs, despite the fact that hospitals are buying them at steep discounts, that's deeply concerning. 
I would add that there's, there's no part of anyone's recovery protocol for them to be stressed out about this, especially when they're going through cancer. Go ahead, Christopher. I'm sorry. And so I, I could just expand on that. Uh, you know, it's not just cancer patients who pay these high prices. They're borne by the, the state of North Carolina, both the health plan, which is funded through the taxpayers, and those, those premium increases that Treasurer Fowler uh, mentioned are paid through out of wages that would have otherwise gone to the state of North Carolina employees and their families. And so if we look nationally, uh, what we see is just you know, the preponderance of pay increases nationally have actually gone or come in the form of healthcare dollars rather than in take home wages. And so I think that just reiterates the importance of not just the study, but the attention that the state of North Carolina has given to this entire issue. And Christopher, I've said in many previous press conferences that uh, this is one of the largest transfers of wealth in my lifetime, uh, especially from low and fixed income people who are, have one thing in common. They're all sick. The, one of the largest transfers of wealth of my lifetime from them individually uh, to these multi-billion dollar corporations who disguise themselves as nonprofits take advantage of many, many programs like this uh, that no one has been able to put the sunlight on. Do you think a legislative requirement is the best or only way to accomplish this? Yes. Uh, as I've said repeatedly, the, the North Carolina General Assembly in a matter of a snap of a finger could take care of many of these issues basically in an afternoon uh, because of the recipes about how to reform the certificate of need process to increase supply of health care, how to catapult North Carolina to number two in the country in terms of uh, protecting people from medical debt. Uh, that law is already uh, in the General Assembly and they could pass it in a matter of, of minutes. Uh, the hospital executives themselves uh, disclosing where their contracts are, going back to Frank's point, uh, which would clearly demonstrate, I think, to us that it's always profits over patients instead of patients over profits. Uh, and making sure that their charity care aligns with their um, <clears throat> the billions of dollars of tax benefit they get. And as I said earlier, this has nothing to do with uh, what political party you're a member of. Uh, I'm a conservative, that's no secret to anyone in this room, uh, but I'm also a Quaker. And I feel strongly that if you put your efforts on doing what's fair and just in the beginning, there's not as much need for charity at the end. Uh, and that's why, that's how, that's the culture and that's the spirit in which we've always approached this. And in, the root word of conservative is to conserve. The root word of liberal is to liberate, to set economically free. When people have fear of getting medical attention, not because of the of the procedure, but the fear of the bill, people cannot have the joy of achievement and be liberated into the into the upper mobility that they deserve in our society. Got a question? <coughs> question. Richard, you should be able to unmute your mic now. Hi there, Treasurer Falwell. Uh, this is Rich uh, with WRAL. Had a question. I think if we asked hospitals, they're probably going to tell you that some of these profits are being turned into cancer programs or clinics that are helping people um, in other ways. They're not a direct refund on a specific cancer drug. How do you respond to that? Well, I respond in two ways. Uh, they taught me at Winston-Salem State and UNC Greensboro to follow the cash. And the fact is, is that in the example of Atrium, uh, they have more than half of the state budget as a nonprofit in the bank account. Over half the state budget is in a bank account as a nonprofit. They didn't make that money off selling TV advertising. They did not make that money off developing software. They made all of that money on the backs of sick people. The second thing I would say is that never in seven years as the hospital association or any of these other entities had the courage, and that's the word I want to use, the courage to show up at, at any event to actually have an open conversation where the press or anyone else can ask them any question about any of this. What you will get is statements from spokespeople. But 
the people that need to take responsibility for this are the multi-million dollar executives who work at these nonprofits who refuse to show us our comp their compensation packages, which would clearly demonstrate that they're putting profits over patients. So that's my response to them, but since they've never had the courage to show up other than through a typewriter or through a tweet, uh, we never know how to get to the, what the real answers are. If I can follow up on that, were any invited to this presser or were they involved in any way in this study? Uh, no, uh, and every opportunity that in seven years where we've tried to actually have a dialogue with them about how to uh, adhere to both the current and the previous president's executive orders, uh, no interest. Uh, any of the other studies that uh, we've done over the last several years about the million, billions of dollars they made during COVID, uh, it's always through a statement. Uh, the profits uh, by suing patients, it's, everything's always through a statement. Uh, I've said repeatedly, and the people in this room know this, anytime, any place, anywhere, our door, our mind, and our heart are open, open in meeting with these individuals to get to the right solution. And I said to a member of the United States Senate uh, two weeks ago about this particular topic and other topics, any public official who is unwilling to talk to anyone about any of the serious problems that are facing our society right now and refuses to do so should resign. That's where we are and that's how serious this is. Follow up. Um, I, just one more, I guess, where would you want to see that money go to directly? Those discounts. Uh, the discount should be passed on uh, to the patients. Uh, the discount should be used for the intended purpose of the 340B program, which is to match the charity care that they're supposed to be offering with the billions of dollars of tax benefit that they receive for being a nonprofit. We're not just talking about federal taxes. We're talking about state taxes. We're talking about property taxes. We're talking about local sales taxes. We're talking about taxes that fund public education systems across the state. Uh, and secondly, get back to their original mission. You know, we don't mind these entities having money in reserves. Uh, but the fact is, is that when they will not tell people what things cost, when people have a fear of getting the procedure because of, of a fear of the bill, uh, where, they, where, where they have poor track records of matching their charity care with the billions of dollars of tax benefits, when they put liens on people's houses and break their kneecaps uh, for not paying their bill, uh, we are a long way away uh, from solving these problems. But that's how cartels work. In the Webster's Dictionary, cartels are defined as associations which are formed to restrict competition or raise prices. They don't care about any of this. That's why they don't have to show up for press conferences. That's why they don't have to show up and actually answer questions in front of the media. That's why they don't have to show their compensation program packages, which will clearly demonstrate, in my opinion, that they always put profits over patients. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Any other questions? Uh, Julie, I want to wrap us up and thank our researchers. And uh, I want to say, I also want to thank their employers at Brown University, if you'll get that message to Christopher. Uh, and I want to remind our friend from the University of Minnesota, there's, I think, a Falwell, Minnesota, <laughs> somewhere in that state. So uh, maybe I look forward to getting there one day. So uh, I'm uh, uh Julie or our researchers. Great. Say, do you have anything to add that you that we didn't cover that you'd like to see? No, I'd just like to reiterate again that this is a program, one of our policymakers here in Minnesota has called it a hidden subsidy. And I really think that that is the best way to talk about it. It is a program that has an intimidating name that is difficult to learn about, but really has implications for patients in a myriad of ways. 
So I applaud you for, um, for weighing in on this important topic. Great. And Treasurer, should we move to your closing remarks? Well, uh, I want to thank all of you for uh, making this report jump up on the table. I know it's been a long time in coming. I want to thank the uh, State Employees Association for uh, partnering with us on this important topic and as well as staff who made this technologically uh, uh, happen. So thank you all very much and, and thank CBS 17 for showing up in person. Thank you all. This concludes our press conference.